चर्मस्वूपिणे अवतार वरिष्ठाय रामकृष्णा ते नम परात्मेक जगदीजमाद्यम निरीह निराकार यो जायते पाल्यते ये विश्व तमीशं भजे लीयते यश्व my humble pranams <coughs> to revered swami nikhileshwarananda ji maharaj my pranams to revered swami bodhmayananda ji maharaj my pranams to all the revered swamis assembled here seated here in the audience and my namaskars to dr sudha sheshayan and shrimati harini verma and my namaskars to all of you dear devotees and students <coughs> just now we heard <coughs> a two very beautiful talks delivered by dr sudha sheshayan and harini verma ji and both the talks were very inspiring in fact after listening to dr sheshayan i was just wondering what more is left for us to talk about because she has already touched upon the main point but anyway in the shastras it is stated that repetition is not a defect the same ideas have to be repeated on the spiritual path and the intention behind this repeated mentioning of the same truth or certain qualities and virtues which we have to develop in spiritual life the intention behind that is to make these virtues go deep inside the human system so that our lives become transformed so in a way the shastras this great principle is saving me also because i am going to just repeat many of those points which uh, dr sheshayan has presented before all of us <coughs> to start with when i first read shashi maharaj's life of course his life is like a torch it's a beacon <coughs> but one thing which struck a direct chord in my heart was one teaching which you will find in his teaching sections of shashi maharaj in the apostles of shri ramakrishna after shashi maharaj's life has been given towards the end you will see after every apostle's life is discussed towards the end you will find teachings of that particular personality so in shashi maharaj's one teaching it is simply beautiful what did shashi maharaj say Shashi Maharaj says, "Actually, we don't have faith in the presence of God. Mind is what's very important." Shashi Maharaj is saying that actually most of us don't have faith in God. Why do I say that? He says like that. The language is like that. Why do I say like that? He says, "If anyone has got." faith in the presence of god then fears and anxieties can never come into the human mind the very fact that we are constantly troubled by fears and anxieties in our life it shows that we actually don't have faith in the presence of the divine 
this teaching has got something to do with his own life and character. Most of us, we may be thinking that we are bhaktas, we are devotees, and what do we mean by becoming devotees? We believe it's a faith, it's a direct shraddha that the divine is present. And if we really have this faith that divine is always present with us, it is throbbing in our hearts. In that case, to talk about fears and anxieties in our life is a matter of contradiction. Such a beautiful observation which comes from Shashim Maharaj, which has remained with me throughout my monastic life. If a person really believes in the presence of the divine, that person cannot be tormented by the problems of fears and anxieties. How true it is. Shashim Maharaj lived that kind of a life. In the Shastras, <coughs> Shweta Shweta Upanishad, a very important verse comes there towards the end of the Upanishad, where the Rishi says, Yasya Deve Parabhakti, Yatha Deve Tatha Guru, Tasyete Katitha Yartha, Prakashante Mahatmana, Prakashante Mahatmana. Twice, Prakashante Mahatmana is mentioned towards the end of that. It only indicates the certitude that only that person's or in the life of that person, the illumination, the experience of the Atman can become possible. Who has got Parabhakti for Ishvara and the same kind of Parabhakti for one's own Guru? Now, Shashi Maharaj was the very personification of this Guru Bhakti, we already know this point has been touched upon. What else actually Shashi Maharaj demonstrates in his life? And this is the one reason, a very interesting uh, incident which takes place, which is connected to this, this hundred percent, or you may say even more than that, something which is not quantifiable. That kind of a Guru Bhakti which we find in Shashi Maharaj's life. Owing to this great virtue in Jashim Maharaj's personality and character, Naren, who has not become Swami Vivekananda then, after the passing away of Sri Ramakrishna, when it was time for them to take the monastic vows, at that time, Naren wanted to take the name Ramakrishnananda for himself. But he gave up this claim and he felt that it is Shashim Maharaj who is actually more eligible to receive this great name. <clears throat> because Naren had seen the kind of maddening Guru Bhakti which we find in Shashi Maharaj's life. Now when we talk about Guru Bhakti, now before I go to that point of Guru Bhakti, let me just state one more thing. We all know Swami Vivekananda came back from the West, from America, and uh, he first came to Madras, his famous, the great five lectures, the burning words coming from the mouth of the modern prophet, which had awakened this great land, the sleeping land. All those things had happened in this memorable city of Madras of that time. My plan of campaign, the future of India, all these wonderful lectures which Swami Vivekananda had given here. And then when Swami Vivekananda was leaving the city, the devotees of Madras, they requested, they didn't want this work to just come to an end there. They wanted something solid to be established. And with that earnest in desire, they requested Swami Vivekananda, the Swamiji, please you have to send somebody here who will continue this work which you have started, the work of spreading the message of Vedanta, and the message of Sri Ramakrishna. And at that time, Swami Vivekananda had stated, yes, I will send you a person who will be more orthodox than the most orthodox men of southern part of India, and who will be unsurpassed and unique 
in his worship and meditation on God. And by the next ship, we find Shashi Maharaj landing in the southern part of India and rest is history. Now, why did Swami Vivekananda choose Shashi Maharaj for this work of South India? Shashi Maharaj embodied within himself certain very orthodox traits and characteristics, which is usually not seen in everybody. Orthodoxy is a quality actually, and it comes maybe from Purva Sanskaras. Everybody, everybody cannot be endowed with these very staunch, strong, orthodox virtues and qualities. Shashi Maharaj had these wonderful qualities, and that's why he was chosen by Swami Vivekananda to go to the citadel of orthodoxy in India. The southern part of India is that headquarters of orthodoxy for the last several millenniums. This is that part of India where actually speaking the great Vedic culture is even today kept alive by the people here. This is a great credit going to the people of southern part of India. So anyhow, Shashi Maharaj and his unique Guru Bhakti. And we talk about Shashi Maharaj's Guru Bhakti, something which uh, is very difficult. It, it, it may sound to be like stories. Sometimes difficult to even believe. Can a human being be like this? But these stories and legends were a fact and reality. Shashi Maharaj, during Sri Ramakrishna's lifetime, he used to serve Sri Ramakrishna with all his heart and soul. We know that what happened in Kashipur when Sri Ramakrishna was alive. And interestingly, even after the passing away of Sri Ramakrishna, Shashi Maharaj's service to Sri Ramakrishna continued in the same fashion as if Sri Ramakrishna was alive. This is something amazing, unbelievable. Keeping a, keeping a photograph in front, but not looking at the photograph as photograph, but as a living human being. How many of us can do that? Now we all devotees, we all have the tendency that we pray to the divine to gift us, to bless us with this great quality of experiencing the presence of the divine. This is the every devotee's heartfelt, earnest wish. Any sincere devotee will have this aspiration that I should be experiencing the living presence of the divine. It's understood. It is understandable. But for Shashi Maharaj, there was no need for him to pray. Because for him, that was actually the fact of his experience. He was literally experiencing the presence of Sri Ramakrishna in his life, even after the passing away of Sri Ramakrishna. And if somebody is uh, experiencing the divine, the real breathing, pulsating presence of the divine in a certain form, what will be the consequence of that? The consequence of that in that person's life is going to be only one. That will take the form of uninterrupted seva and service of that deity. Now this also we find in Bhagavatam and the scriptures, those who have read Bhagavatam, they will see. You can see that specially expressed in the lives of gopis and even Yashoda. For a sincere devotee, these bhaktas, for them, the practices like japam, closing the eyes and meditation, these things they consider to be gauna and secondary. It's very interesting. So what is the mukhya sadhana for such devotees? The param mukhya sadhana of such devotees is the uninterrupted seva and service of the living deity, the living presence of the deity. But this we can see in the lives of gopis and Yashoda. They would not tolerate any interruption in their service to the living deity. Now this, what we find in the Shastras, Shashi Maharaj was the living embodiment of this great qualities which we find in the Bhaktas. 
he would just like what would a mother do when she is making hot rotis and if she has to serve her child she would be preparing hot rotis and straight hot from the pan she would be serving hot rotis to the child is it not simple fact shashi maharaj would do the same thing with the portrait of shri ramakrishna shri ramakrishna's photograph is there and if something hot has to be served to this portrait or i may say the living presence of shri ramakrishna shashi maharaj would keep the stove burning and one by one he would pick that particular commodity and serve the living presence of shri ramakrishna this was the palpable presence of shri ramakrishna which shashi maharaj used to experience in his life in the midnight he would get up and start fanning shri ramakrishna with the feeling that shri ramakrishna sleep should not be disturbed just like we would do to our grandfathers and fathers those who are elderly suppose if there is no fan no ac nowadays all the facilities are there suppose in the olden days these things were not there so we would anybody who is dedicated to one's parents would get up and fan similarly shashi maharaj would get up and this fanning would continue for hours together and most interestingly the onlookers those who see all these things from the behind the scene for them it for most of them it would seem like an aberration they would find it very difficult to believe that this is something something seriously wrong with shashi maharaj but when they would talk to shashi maharaj when they would ask shashi maharaj about what he is doing the words which shashi maharaj would speak the ringing sincerity of his words would completely transform the questioner's mind and they also would begin to feel the living presence of shri ramakrishna this was shashi maharaj's life which was demonstrating something which we all aspire for it is very interesting what we are aspiring for every bhakta every sadhaka for shashi maharaj that was a living pulsating throbbing reality what a wonderful thing it is now if this was shashi maharaj's uh, devotion to shri ramakrishna his gurudev he had that same kind of love for his brother disciples he was actually a love person if were love personified i should, I should say <coughs> his love for his gurudev gets translated or transformed into his love for his brother disciples now because whatever his gurudev liked all those things become extremely dear to him now these brother disciples the monastic disciples of shri ramakrishna they were extremely dear they were all antaranga of shri ramakrishna and therefore shashi maharaj had deep love for them also now this was demonstrated in i should say in baranagar math the first math of the ramakrishna math which was started in 1886 there we all know what happened it's a wonderful chapter in the in the in the history of ramakrishna math and ramakrishna mission those years of Ra, of baranagar math is simply something which uh, everybody would be simply fascinated and thrilled to read and which would appear to be like a story today because today we are living in so much of opulence that was a time when there was hardly anything in the mutt even to eat at that time shashi maharaj would become the mother of mutt he would allow all other brother disciples to do sadhana it is said that these brother disciples they would get up 3 3 o'clock in the morning and from 3 in the morning they would sit for meditation sometimes the meditation would continue till till 4 o'clock 5 o'clock in the evening just imagine that was the spirit and passion at that time it was shashi maharaj who would say you meditate you do tapasya you study scriptures don't disturb your sadhana i will look after the mat and he would go to any extent to ensure that all the basic needs of the mat are taken care of and shashi maharaj would literally go and beg for those commodities and ensure that his brother disciples who had given up everything for the sake of this guru maharaj they are not 
troubled in any way. He would literally drag them from meditation and feed them. That was the kind of spirit which Sashi Maharaj served the monastic disciples of Guru Maharaj and that also was the expression of his one-pointed, unflagging Guru Bhakti. Amazing thing which we find in his life. Now, if this was the kind of Guru Bhakti getting translated or transformed into his love for his monastic disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, the same love then gets transformed into the love for the entire human race and humanity. It is love, 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 throughout its love. The love for the Supreme Divine getting transformed into the love for every living creature. And this gets demonstrated in his life which he led in this great city of Madras. We know what he did here. This starting of this mud, the student's home, all the educational activities, in fact, if I am not wrong, if I am remembering correctly, if I am wrong, somebody can correct me. I think this educational activity was actually initiated by Shashi Maharaj himself. Something like in Coimbatore, he came across a few orphaned children. Their parents had passed away owing to an attack of plague. And moved by the sufferings of these orphaned children, he started, he took those children and the educational activity was started and today this Coimbatore is one of the biggest educational, not one of the, it is the biggest educational institution of Ramakrishna Mutt and Ramakrishna Mission. So the person who started, so the person who started this great work, the main point is his intense love which moved him to take this great initiative and that is what we find in this activity which happened in Madras and all of the southern India. All the centers which came about, most of the centers were started by Shashi Maharaj. We all know this. <coughs> now, Shashi Maharaj is uh, one more important point. Uh, this is directly connected to me also. I don't want to drag this talk much more because this is very, the core crux is that maddening love of Shashi Maharaj for his guru which was a living presence for him, which we have to try to feel. Now, Shashi Maharaj was not a big orator as such, but he was a great scholar, scholar of scriptures, very well grounded in our Shastras. He would converse in Sanskrit with the Sanskrit scholars of Madras city of his time. Just imagine, he didn't know Tamil. So what is the language in which he can converse? English, of course. And he would converse with these Sanskrit scholars in Sanskrit language. And most interestingly, now what happened, let me just connect this particular point with my own self, what happened. Now two days back, I traveled all the way from Mayavati in the Himalayas to the southernmost state of India, Tamil Nadu. It is almost traveling 3000 kilometers from the Himalayas to Tamil Nadu. So when our dear Dharmishtanandaji, Sridhar Maharaj, <coughs> he invited me for this program, I was just wondering in my mind, traveling 3,000 kilometers just for a 20 minutes talk? This thought came into my mind when you first spoke to me. It really I was wondering, traveling 3,000 kilometers to give just 20 minutes talk? At that time, I was reminded about Shashi Maharaj. Shashi Maharaj used to go long distance in this Madras to give talks and lectures. And many of the times it used to be such that he goes to the auditorium and he finds there is not a single soul there to listen to his talk. And what would Shashi Maharaj do? He would not come back. He would sit there. He would deliver his talk. Sometimes he would not deliver his talk, but he would sit there for one hour in meditation and he would come back. What an eye-opener is this great life of Shashi Maharaj. For him, it was a vow. It was a vow. It was an order given by his leader, Swami Vivekananda, and that was the ultimate command. His life was given to fulfilling the orders given by his great leader, Swami Vivekananda. So before I just conclude my talk, once again, let me just go back to the same point with which I started. 
If we really have the faith in the divine presence in our life, let us not forget this point that we cannot be tormented by fears and anxiety in our life. That is a contradiction. And that is the great quality which, find, which we find demonstrated in Shashi Maharaj's life. And one more point, a beautiful teaching which comes in Shashi Maharaj's teaching is, he says, you know, if a pen were conscious, if a pen were conscious, the pen may think that it has written so many pages and so many books, but actually it was held by somebody else and that pen was just an instrument. Shashi Maharaj used to say that he is like that. Whatever he did, he was being moved by a higher force. And this is another great lesson which all of us have to remember. We may be thinking that I did this, I did that, and all kinds of sankalpas which go in our mind. We should understand that we are mere puppets in the hands of a higher power which actually moves us. So, I pray to the Divine that let all of us too have that kind of a spirit of surrender and try to understand there is a higher power which is actually holding each one of us and making us move in this life. Thank you so much.